This episode of Block Bytes illustrates an interesting case of subtle lumbar scoliosis, in which ultrasound imaging was very helpful in ensuring successful and uncomplicated spinal anesthesia. The case in question was an older gentleman undergoing elective total hip replacement surgery with a plan for spinal anesthesia. He had never had a spinal before and had no overt contraindications to one. But on history taking, he mentioned that he had a scoliotic spine and degenerative disc disease, although he was presently asymptomatic and had been told that no surgical intervention was required at this stage. The patient, however, did not have a very obvious scoliosis when we set him up, with perhaps the only clue being his tendency to lean slightly to the left. As is common in many slightly heavier patients, the lumbar fat pad made palpation of the spinous processes difficult, and it was thus uh, difficult to establish the deformity with just clinical examination. A later review of his old x-rays showed that he did in fact have quite a significant scoliosis with a convex curve to the left at the lumbar spine. Time to get out the ultrasound then. Placing the probe in the left parasatural view, we obtain a good view of the L5-S1 space, which is immediately reassuring. This is what I refer to as my get out of jail free option. The L5 to S1 space is almost always open when the other spaces are closed. I use a mix of plain bupivacaine diluted with sterile water, which is significantly hypobaric, and in my hands at least, removes any concerns about adequate block height for hip surgery. Sliding the probe cranially, we see a narrower L4-5 space, but then something peculiar happens. The sawtooth view of the lamina disappears, and we instead see a tall dropout shadow which is a spinous process, in this case, that of L3. This is a clue that the patient has a lumbar scoliosis. As the probe was slid cranially in a vertical line, instead of visualizing each lamina in turn, the spinous process enters the beam instead as the spine curves to the left in this case. If, however, we slide the probe to the left at this point, the beam will once again now enter the paramedian interlamina window and give us a view of the anterior complex of the L3-4 space. Note, however, that to obtain this view, the probe does not have to be tilted towards the midline as is usually necessary. This is because of the rotational scoliosis that always accompanies the lateral curvature. This rotation allows the ultrasound beam to enter the canal in a strict parasagittal plane without the need to angle obliquely. So parasatural imaging with the ultrasound has allowed us to independently confirm the presence of a lumbar scoliosis with a convex curve to the left. This is further verified by turning the probe transverse and visualizing the spinous process shadow. When we do this, we can see that the spinous process shadow is tilted and not perfectly vertical. Rocking the probe to point it towards the left shoulder, we'll return this shadow to the vertical. This is in accordance with the Bovex rule. The vertebral body always rotates towards the convex side of the curve. In this case, you can actually see to the L4-5 space through the midline as evidenced by the anterior complex. However, it is a narrow window. It would be better to target the large paramedian interlaminar window that we identified at L3-4 on the left convex side of the curve. In sliding the probe up to the L3-4 level, we can clearly see an anterior complex to the left of the spinous process shadow. We can center this anterior complex on the screen and mark its position on the skin. If the ultrasound beam can penetrate to image the anterior complex, then the needle will be able to follow the same trajectory to enter the vertebral canal. Local anesthetic infiltration should occur without any resistance as the needle is passing through paraspinal muscle and not the interspinous ligament. Because of the rotation of the spine, the needle can be inserted without any angulation to enter the vertebral canal using a paramedian approach. Here we see our first-year resident using the imaging information and marks to successfully perform spinal anesthesia in a single pass. The spinal needle passes through paraspinal muscle to engage the ligamentum flavum and eventually enter the intrathecal space.
I hope that this was a useful look at exactly how to apply ultrasound imaging of the spine in scoliosis. For a more detailed discussion, check out my earlier video and others on uraxial anesthesia in the challenging patient.